Uh, I want to thank uh, ICSR for this uh, great opportunity. I also want to thank Des for this uh, nice introduction. Um, with this audience, I don't need to uh, emphasize the importance of heart failure, which is affecting 20, more than 26 million people worldwide. A number of uh, uh, risk factors contribute to the pathophysiology of heart failure, uh, including coronary artery disease, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, etc. Uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to present a project in the lab regarding uh, heart blood pressure induced uh, cardiac hypertrophy and heart failure. The heart is an extremely plastic organ. Its response to stimuli, the heart may shrink or grow. Under high blood pressure condition, the heart undergoes pathological hypertrophy growth, which may progress into a heart failure. This process, however, is not a simple piling of sarcomeres in cardiomyocyte, therefore to increase the heart, um, rather it consists of a number of metabolic events, uh, metabolic remodeling events, uh, structural remodeling, electrophysiological, and uh, functional remodeling events. A number of years ago, a study from Tegmar's lab showed glucose metabolic remodeling precede most, if not all, other remodeling events during uh, cardiac hypertrophy growth and heart failure. As uh, Dr. Carvey showed in his talk previously, uh, uh, glucose me metabolic remodeling played an essential role in this process. In this study, um, Tegmar's lab published in 2013, the glucose uptake is significantly increased in the hypertrophy heart as early as one day after surgery. In another study from Michael Erla's lab in 2003, what they found was glucose oxidation uh, in the hypertrophy heart is not proportionally increased, actually showing a trend of a decrease, also as uh, Dr. Carvey showed in his presentation. So this, for us, raises an interesting question, which is a large quantity of glucose after entering cardiomyocyte may not be uh, oxidized. Rather, it's metabolized through other signaling pathways. So the glucose after entering cardiomyocyte is um, metabolized by uh, you know, uh, at least four um, different downstream signaling events. We are particularly interested in one of those is um, uh, hexosamine biosynthetic pathway, HPP. In this process, glucose after entering cardiomyocyte is converted to UDP glucanac uh, as a final product through a series of enzymatic reactions. UDP glucanac is a substrate for a number of biosynthetic reactions. For example, it can be conjugated to serine or threonine sites on multiple proteins. This process is called O-glucanac modification, um, which has uh, also been uh, introduced last week by uh, Johannes Banks talk about uh, O-glucanac modification in diabetic heart uh, regulated by HDAC4. Previous studies have uh, associated HPP uh, with hyper hypertrophy growth and heart failure. For example, this study by uh, Martin Young, when he was a fellow in Tegmar's lab, uh, they show UDP gluconag as the final product is significantly elevated in hypertrophy heart compared to sham. Consistent with this, a study from Steve Johns uh, um, from University of Louisville find that uh, uh, O-glucanic protein modification in the uh, hypertrophy heart is significantly increased compared to sham. So while this study suggests a, a significant association between HPP and the cardiac hypertrophic growth, I think one question remains to be fully answered is whether HPP is uh, associative or uh, causative in this process. Based on the preliminary data from our lab and previous findings from uh, published literature, we came to a hypothesis. We hypothesized hexosamine biosynthetic pathway is a driving force for pressure overload induced uh, hypertrophic growth. To address this, we first tried to associate HPP enzymes with hypertrophic growth. We use this common uh, classic model in the field to induce hypertrophic growth, the theoretic aortic constriction. Uh, Dr. Carvey also used this one in his study uh, as well. In this paper we published a few years back, TAC induced a significant, significant um, cardiac hypertrophy uh, in mice as early as four days after the surgery, uh, as shown by increase of heart rate body weight ratio. Importantly, we found all the enzymes uh, of the HPP pathway are significantly increased across 
different time, uh, all the uh, stage of hypertrophic growth. So after we established the association between HPV enzymes and hypertrophic growth, we went on to show uh, whether it is a causative. We took advantage of a transgenic mouse model overexpressing GFI1. GFI1 is a limiting enzyme of HPP. The assumption is if we overexpress GFI1, then the HPP flux will be significantly uh, enhanced. Here, we clone GFI1 under control of a tetracycline responsive element a promoter, and then we cross this animal with uh, cardiomyocyte-specific TTA transgenic mice. In the double transgenic mice, which is tet off, we put a doxycycline in the drinking water, which can prevent TTA from activation, uh, GFI1 from uh, expression. Here, in the adult mice, when we remove a doxycycline from the drinking water, TTA is activated, and GFI1 is overexpressed only in cardiomyocyte in the heart. We then uh, subject these animals into tag. Importantly, we find the overexpression of GFI1 in cardiomyocyte in mice, leading to more exacerbated uh, pathological cardiac remodeling. As shown here, the high degree of fibrosis, a bigger cardiomyocyte, an increased ratio between heart rate body weight and heart rate tibia length. And more importantly, overexpression of GFI1 leading to a more depressed cardiac function after tech surgery. In contrast, we um, took advantage of the knockout mice model of GFI1 from a cardiomyocyte. Here we cross the GFI1 flux flux animals with uh, inducible creep from a cardiomyocyte. After knockout uh, GFI1 from adult mice, we subject this animal to tech. We found, uh, in contrast to the transgenic mice, knockout GFI1 leading to an improved uh, pathological cardiac remodeling as shown by decrease of uh, cardiomyocyte size a reduction of heart rate body weight ratio, heart rate TP length ratio, and importantly, the uh, deletion of GFI1 from cardiomyocyte leading to improvement of uh, the pathological cardiac remodeling as shown by enhance of the cardiac function. So this uh, uh, gain loss function study suggests that HPP is indeed one of the driving force of pathological cardiac remodeling. So next, we went on to uh, explore the underlying molecular mechanisms. mTOR is a hub for a number of growth signaling events in uh, almost all cell types. Previous studies in the field have appreciated the, the activation and role of mTOR in cardiac hypertrophy growth. This study by a Tegamars lab in 2013 find uh, the heart and higher workload conditions is associated with the activation of mTOR as shown by mTOR phosphorylation and the downstream uh, S6 kinase and uh, 4BP phosphorylation. More recently, a study from um, uh, Ron Tien's lab in uh, WashU show in cultured mouse side, here PE treatment leading to hypertrophic growth, which also leading to the activation of mTOR signaling. As shown here, as its kinase phosphorylation is increased, and mTOR phosphorylation in both sides, on both sides are uh, elevated. So based on this study, uh, we, came on, we came to a hypothesis, maybe mTOR is mediating HPP-induced hypertrophic growth. To address this, we first overexpress GFI1 by adenovirus infection in cultured mouse site. Here, overexpression GFI1 leading to a activation of mTOR signaling as shown by increased S6 phosphorylation. At the in vivo level, uh, transgenic mice for GFI1 is sufficient to activate mTOR pathway, which is further increased after tech surgery. In contrast, when we silence GFI1 from a cultured mouse site, uh, mTOR signaling is uh, decreased in absence of any treatment or after PE uh, treatment. At the in vivo level, uh, knockout of a GFI1 from a cardiomyocyte leading to a decrease of uh, tag-induced uh, mTOR um, signaling. So this study suggests indeed mTOR uh, is mediating uh, at least partially, uh, partially HBP-induced hypertrophic growth. So the final question we have is if this is the case, when we suppress mTOR, then HPP-induced hypertrophic growth should be uh, inhibited. So here, again, we back to the, uh, the uh, cultured mouse site. When we overexpress GFI1 by uh, adenovirus infection, we found cell size increased. When we treat the cells with rapamycin or torrin one both are inhibitors of mTOR signaling, and the cardiomyocyte growth is significantly decreased. At the in vivo level, 
uh, we treat the control mice or transiting mice with um, a rapamycin to suppress mTOR signaling, and then we subject this animal to tag. So what we found here was rapamycin treatment is associated with decrease of uh, uh, cardiac growth, uh, the heart growth, as shown by decrease of heart rate body weight and heart rate TB length. And importantly, it is associated with the improvement of uh, 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 cardiac function after tech surgery in the transgenic mice. So um, in summary, uh, cardiac hypertrophy growth is associated with profound metabolic remodeling. The hexosamine biosynthetic pathway is activated and maintained at very high levels by cardiac hypertrophy growth. And chronic persistent elevation of hexosamine biosynthetic pathway leads to exacerbated hypertrophy growth and heart failure, which is likely mediated by sustained mTOR signaling across the whole process of hypertrophy growth. Finally, I want to thank the people who actually did the work. Uh, this project was led by a talented postdoc in Chen, with the help of everybody else uh, in the lab. I also want to thank our uh, collaborators at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center uh, and elsewhere. In particular, I want to thank my uh, PhD mentor, Philip Shear and my postdoc mentor, Joseph Hill. Finally, I want to thank this funding source, AIH, American Heart Association, and American Diabetes Association. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so I would like to thank all the three speakers to finish our uh, session in, on time. Uh, first, thanks to Kutuba, then Zhao, and then finally Chris. Uh, let's start our question answer session. Uh, the first question is from Helen Collins for Kutuba. Uh, so she's wondering whether did Kutuba notice any uh, sex differences uh, with in terms of insulin treatment or TAC uh, or targeting AKT? Um, in, in Kutuba's experiment, uh, or these are data pooled, whether Kutuba used male, male and female mice together to generate these data. Yeah, so um, thank you, Helen. This is a really important question. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to. So, sorry to interrupt you, Kutuba. I think your camera is switched off. Oh. So you may want to, there you yeah, go. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was on the phone. And... Sorry. Yeah, sorry for that. Um, so, um, yeah, ask that question. So the, the main reason that we started the first series of experiment to use male and female is to look if there's any significant differences between the male and female in either the cardiac energy metabolism in general, um, namely uh, glucose oxidation and fatty acid oxidation. And uh, by comparing the data, we didn't see much of a difference between male and female in terms of uh, the translocation of these kinases into the mitochondria. So we can see the same pattern of translocation with male and female. Um, also, um, there was no um, significant difference between um, cardiac energy metabolism in terms of glucose and fatty acid oxidation, uh, and glycolysis as well. So um, in the next, well, with the, with the next series, we just decided to continue using both as far as they are both physiologically relevant and there's no significant difference. And then we pulled all the data together. So yeah, so the little secret here is that we, with male and female, thinking that there might be some differences, but no, after um, the experiments and analyzing data, we pulled them together. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, the next question I'm seeing is um, for you, Katuba, as well. It says, were there any changes in GLUT4 due to altered AKT signaling? Yeah, um, that's a, I, I think, Joe Sun is, is asking about whether, what is the site of action for the phosphorylate? I'm understanding the question correctly. He's asking, what is the site of action inside the mitochondria for the mitochondria like AT? This, uh, that, that's a, a really good and important question that we are trying now to find out. For, uh, we reopened recently, so we, we, we're getting into that, and uh, I, I would be happy to share that very, very soon. Yeah. Thank you, Kutuba. The next question is from Viswani, and uh, 
Um, the question is whether you have noticed any kind of insulin receptor changes uh, in your stress heart. Yeah, another good question. I, I'm, I'm really sorry, guys. I, I, we just finished this first series of our heart failure experiment um, uh, just before the lockdown. So this is all in the process of the analysis. So hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to tell that very soon. But we're really looking into that, absolutely. Great. Um, I think some of the questions I might see might be a little bit different. I'm trying to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, the next question I see asks um, I is, Eric will, um, will that fold? sorry, is aimed at Katuba as well. Um, it says, do you, do you analyze for effects of the inhibitors on other classic insulin response pathways? including insulin-dependent glucose transporter GLUT4 in different studies? Uh, yeah, well, for, for, the, um, for the series of experiments that we did with the inhibitors, it was acute exposure, and we looked at the expression of um, GLUT4 and GLUT1 as well, and we didn't see um, much of a difference with, these, with any of the inhibitors. So, um, yeah, we looked into that. We didn't see much of a difference. Um, I think the question's a little bit jumbled, that's why uh, the, it's not in order, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, this question is for Kutubai again, uh, and it's from Eric Weatherford, and he's wondering whether um, you use separate uh, antibodies for AKT1, 2, or you use the like, general AKT antibody. Yeah, no, absolutely, important question. Um, so f for the data that I showed, uh, this is for... Um, AKT1 and AKT2, um, it wasn't specific. But what we're doing now is to go and see which AKT, it, whether it's AKT1 or AKT2, is actually more important in this. Or maybe they are both important. So this is, this is what we're doing right now. No, uh, it's an important question. Great. Um, <clears throat> the next question that I'm seeing is for you, Katuba, as well, from Gary Baxter, that asks, um, do you, the attack model is a pressure overload model. Do you know if the role of AKT in stimulating glucose oxidation might be different in ischemic cardiomyopathy? Yeah, so, um, hi, Gary. Um, so Gary Baxter is my PhD mentor, um, and it's lovely to see him um, watching today. Um, so, yeah, so, we haven't done any work um, with ischemic cardiomyopathy um, model, but what we know from experiment is that um, what we see, um, what this, this uncoupling between glycolysis and glucose oxidation um, exists in, um, for example, models of ischemia reperfusion during ischemia and um, during reperfusion, as well as we see as well in um, different models of, of um, diabetic cardiomyopathy. Um, so I would speculate that maybe the, there is a, um, a good potential for this to happen in the ischemic cardiomyopathy as well. But good question. Sorry, Kutuba, to, to give you shock. We did not plan this to give you uh, no time to pre prepare your question, but it just happened. Anyway, the, the question I see the next is from Constantinos, and again, it's for you. Uh, so the, he's wondering whether the balance between phospho-AKT mediated effect of insulin versus release of fatty acids from the intracellular lipid stores. Yeah, no, hi Constantino, how's it going? So uh, really good question. Um, so what I can comment on is the um, effect of uh, phospho AKT and what it does to um, the glucose oxidation. I honestly not aware of the importance of this mechanism in deploying intracellular lipid store or how it will act or its role in in, in deploying the um, lipid store in the heart. But I'm sure you know, so um, you probably can can explain it a little bit. But I, I'm I'm sorry I don't know about the fact. But I can I can speak to the um, 
the role of IKT in mediating the dark sensory stimulation or glucose oxidation. Thank you. All right, the next question I'm seeing is for Dr. Wong. Um, it says, as you mentioned, several groups, including our group, demonstrated the importance of oglucnac in hypertrophy development under TAC or ANG2 treatment, um, inhibiting oglucnac being sufficient to block hypertrophy development. However, we also showed that treatment with OGA inhibitors are excellent oglucnac inducers, but are not sufficient alone to promote cardiac hypertrophy. Um, what is your clue to reconcile these data and your nice paper? Um, first of all, I want to thank this question, and I'm very familiar with this paper, and we actually talk about it in our lab meeting groups. Um, uh, yes, indeed. Um, but it's, uh, from our understanding, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's indeed a certain treatment that does not directly lead into hypertrophic growth. Um, we also try to work on why. I think one of the explanations we have is um, um, the downstream events is not a general uh, increase of gluconectin modification. It's a rather uh, certain players or K players being modified. Uh, so if you only look at uh, the increase of gluconectin modification in all cardiac proteins, it may, be, may just shadow uh, specific changes. Uh, I know it sounds like a, a, impossible to understand, but that's what we try to, fix, try to figure out what particular um, uh, protein being modified uh, is not or uh, and it's not just the general total increase of gluconide modification. And uh, I also want to point out is um, when we treat the uh, cardiomyocyte with gluconide, uh, we find uh, uh, different concentrations uh, give different the result, uh, effects on cardiac hypertrophy growth. For example, we have a certain concentration, uh, about two concentrations, they all increase gluconide modification, but only one of those. Uh, leading to hypertrophy growth. So I think, uh, as I say, possibly uh, due to selective change in specific proteins. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Kutuba again. Uh, and this uh, attendee is wondering whether you notice any kind of GLUT4 changes to your altered AKT signaling. Yeah, uh, good question. I, I think I, I already answered that question. Um, we, we looked at the uh, translocation of of um, of GLUT4 um, and the expression of it um, in the normal heart, and we didn't see much of a difference. In terms of, of heart failure, we haven't done that work yet, but it's, it's a work in progress, so um, hopefully soon we'll be able to tell. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I think I dropped off for a minute on the Zoom call and it erased some of the questions on my end. But the next one I'm seeing is for uh, Zhao Wang that says, congratulations on your work. How about inflammatory status in GFAT1 mice? Um, we, mm, we did not measure uh, the inflammatory uh, markers in circulation, but we did was in the transgenic mice, uh, in knockout mice, we did uh, look at in the heart, um, it, uh, at protein at the MRI levels of uh, uh, inflammatory markers. In the transgenic mice, we see the increase of uh, certain uh, biomarkers, uh, and then in the knockout mice, it's decreased. We didn't put it in the paper, but that's the uh, findings we had. Thanks. So the next uh, comment is from Thomas, and then it's for Kutuba. So uh, Thomas is wondering, uh, how can you explain your recent data uh, suggest which suggests AKT enhancement is protective in TAC. However, there are a couple of uh, publications from Zumo's lab, as well as Ken Walsh's lab, where they kind of notice the opposite uh, to show physiological hypertrophy and cardiac dysfunction with AKT. How can you explain your present data? Yeah, no, absolutely. Hi, Thomas. Um, so, good question. The, um, I think I'm aware of these studies, and they are really, um, really high quality studies. However, um, I don't think there is a, a general consensus about the role of the cost of between IKT and um, mTOR uh, so far. And the literature is just um, supporting both sides of the arguments, whether um, IKT activity can trigger um, or can stimulate mTOR and vice versa. But what I can 
tell you is that in different models of heart failure um, that we looked at and we investigated, we, we often see the improvement in insulin sensitivity, which is um, often accompanied with an increase in the activity of AKT, is um, also associated with decrease in AMTO activity. So uh, the question becomes which isoform of AKT is important to trigger mTOR. Um, and the other important question is what pocket and what residual mTOR that can be more important than the other pockets and, and, and residues. I think, I think th this is a, a really interesting scope for further um, investigation. I'm just hoping I didn't get this question for um, your BCAE paper. It's going to be a difficult one to answer. Uh, Kutuba, sorry, do you mind if I just butt in quickly? I mean, yeah. has anybody compared the AKT levels in these different experimental conditions? You know, are you inducing different, you know, chain, levels of changes in AKT expression? Yeah, that's a really good uh, question, Dara. Uh, so, in terms of the mitochondrial translocation um, in this experiment that I showed, um, when we stimulate these hearts with insulin, we see an accumulation of, of AKT in, inside the mitochondria. So the answer is yes, we see an increase in the uh, accumulation of, of this, um, of AKT inside the mitochondria. And we see that this accumulation following insulin stimulation is impaired in the failing heart. So that was um, the main conclusion uh, from the um, last study that I showed you. Um, we think that this impairment in mitochondrial translocation of AKT in, into the mitochondria is what, what playing a major role in impaired insulin stimulated glucose, glucose oxidation in, in the failing heart. So, uh, yeah. Okay. But you have no evidence of kind of differences in expression, really, or, or you can't speculate on that, really, can you? For different isoforms of AKT, well, I mean, for different, you know, different models that have been used, like overexpressing models. Oh, uh, no, no, uh, that, that is uh, other people work. No, um, I, I, I'm not aware that this is, um, this was investigated. I'm just thinking in light of contrasting conclusions, you know, whether no, that's the explanation. I, I, think, I think that's a really good idea. No, I agree. Great, thank you. So the next question um, I'm seeing is from, is for Dr. Zhao Wang. It's from James who says, very nice work. Have you observed any association between mTOR change by HBP pathway associated and cardiac autophagy? Um, that, that's a very important question. Um, we, uh, we find, uh, we, we did, we did uh, uh, try to address this by uh, looking at uh, LC3, for example, or, um, Western blood. Uh, in our hands, we did not see very obvious change, like a very consistent change from experiment to experiment. So, um, we, you know, to be honest, we don't know the answer, but uh, I guess that's very logical to ask whether activate uh, mTOR might suppress uh, autophagy in this process. Uh, one possibility will be at different stage um, of the whole process, the answer might be uh, different. But from short answer is we do not know. We don't have a conclusive answer right now. This is a follow-up question from Viswani to uh, Kutuba again. Uh, I think you answered the GLUT4 part, but do you think uh, GLUT1 somehow get regulated with your uh, inhibitors? Uh, in terms of GLUT1 GLUT with the inhibitors, we didn't see much of a difference in the expression of GLUT4 um, within this short period of, of, um, of time. But we know um, from looking at glycolysis is that there was no significant difference in glucose uptake. Otherwise, that will drive glycolysis to increase. So um, I kind of touched on that very briefly. I'm, I'm sorry because of the time, but we didn't. We don't think we had any um, significant difference in neither glucose uptake um, or the the um, pyruvate supply to the mitochondria as evidenced by no change in, in glycolysis, which is the main control here. Thank you. 
Um, so the next question I'm seeing is for Dr. O'Shea from June Wave, who asks, does oxydeoxymyoglobin affect optical mapping since it will change the absorbance of myocardium? Yeah, so the answer is yes. So this needs the most commonly used dyes within the field have been excited around 530 and then your emissions look at 630 average. So that's right in the sort of in the optical window where you have high absorbance by biological chrome cores, in particular um oxy like deoxyhemoglobin. So well, what we've seen recently and what's very exciting is the structure of dyes which are moved forward to infrared and near infrared spectrum. And why it's important is that it allows them for the possibility of doing optical mapping studies without using crystalloid solutions like Krebs solution and so on, but it actually blunt with these um, systems and it's not a work that. But the answer to that question is with the dyes that are most commonly used, and even with those near infrared dyes, there will be some change. The answer is yes. Okay, so the next question is from Rushita to uh, Kutuba. Uh, she's wondering. Are the underlying mechanism for insulin stimulated mitoglucose oxidation versus enhancement of glucose uptake and glycolysis mutually exclusive? Or is there a crossover between these processes in healthy versus the diseased myocardium? Oh, hi, Shetha. Um, good to see you again virtually. Um, good question, as usual. So um, that's, that's really important to, to explain that what we think happening is that these two pathways, whether it, the direct enhancement of a glucose uptake and glycolysis, and thereby feeding more pyruvate into the mitochondria, um, is working um, in parallel with the direct insulin stimulation of a glucose oxidation in the normal heart. What happens in heart failure is, as I explained in the introduction, we have this uncoupling between um, glycolysis, which goes up in heart failure, um, while glucose oxidation is down as an overall um, mitochondrial oxidative metabolism go, go, goes down in, in, in heart failure. So we think that we're losing the other part of the metabolic effect of insulin on um, cardiac energy metabolism, which is the direct effect on stimulating glucose oxidation. So the, to answer your questions, yes, those are um, two pathways pathways working together in the normal heart and we're losing the mitochondrial part or the direct stimulation of mitochondrial glucose oxidation in the failing heart and that's what, what we're trying to restore. Great. Um, the next question that um, I see is from Oscar Moreno who's asking Chris uh, are you using LED or pulse laser for the stimulation of dyes? Also, I wanted to ask if having, if have you noticed a high variability in atrial action potential duration, and how did you manage the problem of spatial averaging of the signals? Yeah, so to answer the first question, we use LEDs uh, in our specific setups, but uh, other groups also use pulse laser technologies. I think those kind of technologies come more in play when you look at more, say, dual dye experiments we need that or in temporal control, or for example, object net experiments where you have that interplay. The kind of experiments that we've done, it doesn't mean LED illumination works fine. Um, in terms of the actual preparations, we do see high variability in signal quality mainly. So I'd, I'd say it's probably linked to that where you might get changes in change of actual potential duration. I don't see a huge difference in, in actual potential durations. The quality of actual preparations in terms of signal you get tends to be less, just for the specific, just for the very simple idea that you have less tissue less tissue degradation, less signal quality, you also have some thinner tissue and so on. And then, so the third bit about spatial averaging of the signals, again, yes, obviously you have, if you spatial average, you get the uh, blurring of the signal and so on, which obviously isn't that advantageous. Sometimes it's necessary just because of poor quality signals. In general, to try and avoid these problems, you either avoid spatial averaging or what we try to do is more, um, when we do apply spatial averaging, apply sort of Gaussian filter averaging, so you get that sort of very sort of fine control, hopefully getting like rid of the random noise. But yes, that is an issue with optical mapping. Obviously, we try and get these high resolutions. Ideally, in the world, we we'll never do spatial averaging, but it's again one of these interplays between better quality versus actually then sort of being relevant to the actual uh, signal you get on the line. Chris, do you mind? Do you mind if I just just butt in quickly? Um... And, and just ask a, a kind of a follow-up question to that. In your opinion, 
have you ever seen completely different interpretation of, of the same data set based on you know different um, um, sort of processing of the data yeah so obviously if you get a massive underlying change it will be even if you do apply gaussian field don't apply field it'll still be there i think the area we've seen it mostly would be when we looked at sort of change through the upslope so we did that study with the, the james where we looked at carbon oxygen and flecainide which are known to have change and what we did within that study is actually look at different temporal and spatial filters and what you can see is then these are very sort of changes but when you applied some filtering um, methods you can no longer see these changes so yes i think you can the, you can have effects where temporal foot particularly temporal filtering i find if you apply the wrong temporal filter you can really sort of mask actual physiological changes or the underlying physiological baseline conditions so so considering then you are releasing and igor fmr is releasing you know um software for analysis do you think now in the papers we need to specify in our result sections or in our method sections what filtering we've used not only what software have we used oh yeah well, i think most most people well, what i see most people do and they, 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 okay. they, they definitely should i think okay. yeah because even if it's just in the supplement it's definitely a very important factor in particular yeah. if it's up for the mapping figure if if you get these raw signals ideally i'd like to see raw signals all the time as well but Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think now we kind of catch up with Sarah. Uh, if I miss your uh, question, I sincerely apologize in between. But the next question is from Kevin uh, Tukutuba. How does the translocation of phospho AKT occur? In the, in the heart disease, do you have more translocation issue or AKT activity? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure if I have the the data to support what I'm going to say, but here's what happens. So we see that this translocation of AKT is impaired in, 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 um, in the failing heart. I'm, I'm guessing you're asking how this translocation actually happens in, in the normal heart. Um, that's that's a, a really interesting topic that we are trying to look at um i have zero data to do any speculation so i don't know but it's a fantastic question thank you thanks um the next question is from rio it's to Katuba and zhao uh, zhao it is asking they're asking a more general question how does glucose transport from the circulation to the cardiomyocyte is it uptaken first by endothelial cells and then passed to the cardiomyocyte or does it go directly to the cardiomyocytes? Do you want to have a go, uh, Sean? Well, um, I actually not familiar with this. I, I think um, from my understanding is to go through the lymph system. I could be wrong. I'm it's I'm curious to hear both of your answers here. I don't know. <laughs> I, it's an important <laughs> question. Yeah, that's a, that's a better than what I was supposed to. It, 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 um, okay, so he, 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 I, guess I can't comment on what happens at, at the level of the heart, maybe. Uh, so we know that insulin can stimulate um, glucose uptake by stimulating the translocation of GLUT4. And that's why GLUT4 um, is called the insulin responsive um, glucose uh, transporter. But um, the heart can also uh, take up uh, glucose through GLUT1, which is not insulin in, in an in insulin independent manner. So these are the two main glucose transporter into the heart. Um, don't ask me what regulates GLUT1 because I don't know. Um, that's that's why I, I I know about the uptake of glycolysis like, uh, glucose into into the heart. I hope that answers your question. This is like a PhD exam question. I yeah, hope. yeah. I like to find that's out what good, that's a good, but no, absolutely bad question. I, I like it. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think um, we we have a in purpose lab in the Series lab. There's a person working on the lymph system. It it seems like it's a lot unexplored uh, question there right there. How the uh, nutrients or, or 
uh, hormones from the circulation get into the targeting cells. Uh, yeah, the short answer is I, I'm not entirely sure about this. I need to work on those. Okay, so I have a couple of questions for Chris from the same uh, attendee. And so this person is wondering, there are multiple fluorescent dyes which can able to measure metabolic changes. Is it possible to use the combination of voltage or calcium imaging and metabolic imaging in cardiac tissue, in the cardiac tissue, number one? Second question that this person has is, can your software process dual voltage and calcium imaging yeah so the answer to the first question is yes so some of the very earliest optical max experiments actually employed this exact say this exact sort of methodology using metabolic dyes changes with combining them with voltage and so on i have to say i'm not up to speed with the sort of properties of metabolic dyes but again it the main problem will be, as with when you try to combine optical mapping with object genetic techniques, with a spectral overlap problem, the idea that can we effectively separate those two signals? But the answer in theory is definitely yes, and it has been done. Uh, the second question, we're working on it, it's getting there. Um, it's kind of thing that's been very stop start for quite a while now. So, so we have sort of versions that work with, and in principle, everything's there. So you can do it manually within our software at the moment. So basically, in, uh, analyze a voltage. Um, signal completely independently, manage, uh, produce a calcium maps as well, and then sort of interplay them with the raw data. But obviously it's a very elegant solution and we are working on making it so there will be a specific module which takes those two channels and combines the data. And then also hopefully then, if we also do for other guys, for example, metabolic changes and so on. So it's definitely getting there, work in progress, but the answer is kind of at the moment, which is the best answer. But, but, but Chris, this is a really excellent question actually. Yeah. And I think we should yeah, try definitely. this sometimes when we get a chance. Yeah, you I know, agree. induce ischemia locally, see what happens with calcium as well as, I don't know, like maybe some sort of mitochondrial, you know, um, uh, fluorescent dye, which, which will report on mitochondrial activity or something like that. I, I yeah, think. Yeah, not to do. Yeah, no, I think it's a great idea. And I think, yeah, in theory, it's definitely possible. And I've seen it done before. So yeah. I have to read through and go, obviously, these things often are quite hard, it's quite hard to read on yourself. So we'll work out. But yeah. Great. Uh, the next question is also for you, Dr. O'Shea, from Xi. They ask, what do you think is a techni the technique limitation for achieving perfect detection of both calcium and APD signal in mouse heart? Yeah, so there's a, a few different things going on here. So firstly, is just how the dyes interact with each other would be a simple thing. So one of the things that we found is that in preparation, you get really nice loading of action potential dyes individually, really nice calcium dyes individually. Casey, when they you try to combine them both together, you lose one of the signals for various reasons. You think maybe we saturate each in the, with the calcium dye to get the signal or the sort of interplay. The other things which come from a more technical side are, on the software side, it's not too big an issue. As long as you can effectively separate the two uh, systems, either by the wavelength or another method, for example, dual excitation, then it's pretty simple. Just take the signals them independently and put them together at the end. What's more of an issue, and again, we don't, we ourselves haven't done many experiments, but from speaking to other people who have, seems to be the hardware problem, getting that perfect alignment between the tissue, so you know that one pixel in your voltage image is exactly the same as your pixel in your calcium image, and that seems to be an issue for quite a few people, so that's one of the, the other sort of technical uh, limitations. But again, it's, it's routinely possible, and there's many groups that do it, so it's definitely possible. Uh, okay, so the next question, based on the question, I think it is for you, Chris. Uh, so the, I'm, I'm going to tag the follow-up question to uh, the next question together. So if you can answer both at the same time, that would be great. So can you use your technique, optical mapping, in vivo? That's the first question. I think the same attendee is wondering, do you think more than two cameras will reduce the distortion of imaging? Yeah, so the first question, it's uh, getting there. So originally, it was so put quite a few of the different things I talked about, for example, need for mechanical uncoupling, the polymer toxic dyes and so on, has traditionally limited to be an ex vivo technique. But there's been some really nice work, well, actually quite a while ago, sort of using strategies sort of to polymer bypass to achieve this sort of uh, in, more in situ optical mapping. 
there's been recent work combined some of the motion artifact collection techniques with some of the um, sort of those uh, red shifted dyes that I mentioned, which have achieved these almost, you could say, in situ, well, in vivo optic mapping using fiber ray um, detectors. Particular Peter Lee has produced quite a lot of really nice work recently on this uh, subject. So it's getting there. It's not sort of as high resolution, for example, as it is an Eclair or Mouse Heart, but it is getting there. We'll ever get to the point where it's clinically relevant. So there is sort of one or two FDA approved optical voltage dyes and so on. Well, that's a long, long way still away from actually becoming possible. Uh, for the second question, so it depends what sort of distortion the attendees actually thinking about. In terms of mechanical recovery, so if you have a heart that's still beating, it could help slightly because you get those two, two camera views so you can see which way the heart's moving, then you can apply these motion and um, these computer vision techniques. If you talk about distortion just in terms of other artifacts, for example, things like optical blurring and so on, what you need to do really in terms of sort of the 3D architecture is combine sort of ca surface capture software as well, well algorithms actually very detailed to capture software. So having more cameras does help that and make that easier, but it's still not a trivial problem. And in particular, Eagle FMAS group has well, uh, about a couple of years ago now to release sort of suite of open source software platforms for this exact uh, reason, because it's it's really hard computational problem, even with five, well, four cameras. So I look at each view. To combine them all together and get two free up the mapping is still pretty difficult. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Wong uh, from Asma. They ask, um, did you check some common readouts of autophagy like LC3 and Becklin 1? Oh, yeah, I mean, he also follow up with that. Uh, we, we did, uh, like the question I addressed previously, we look at LC3. Um, we didn't look at a back one, but LC3, as I said, uh, we don't have a very consistent and convincing change uh, across different experiments. So um, so we, we think a uh, short answer is we don't think it's strongly changed it. Okay, uh, in my screen, I don't see any more questions. So uh, let's, uh, Sarah and I, thank you. Uh, sorry, there's one more question in the chat from what I can see. Oh. From... Can you see it from Wahiba Dari? Chat. Uh, can you give yeah. us, because I was chatting too much. <laughs> I, I do see it. So it, it sounds like it's for Dr. O'Shea. Um, they say, I'm using optical mapping to image synchronously engrafted cardi cardiomyocytes expressing autonomous voltage sensors with the guinea pig host myocardium diluted. If activation map analysis is done separately for each channel, would it be possible to combine data from both to see if the graft is coupled or not? Yeah, so... I believe so, yes, you'd have to, the problem with combining different channels like that is if you have a defective reference then to basically to stitch those signals together. I believe, yes, without sort of seeing the actual intricacies of this experiment, it sounds like a very complicated set of data there, now, but I don't see why that, why that shouldn't be possible. But, but that should be probably the same issue like the voltage calcium, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, so exactly. exactly. As long as you have uh, an appropriate reference, for example, I don't know how you, for example, you're stimulating these perforations, but if you have something to reference so you can make sure, one of the problems if you analyze two things separately, and for example, R software, which is, you're basically looking at the actual intrinsic signal within, for example, the optical, sig optical voltage signal as a time reference. But so then you're doing that separately with two different channels, you need to make sure there's a common channel or common stimulus in both channels where you can effectively line things. So that would be the only sort of sort of a limiting factor in doing that. But that should be routinely possible from what you say. But but Wahiba, I mean I would just say that you may want to just contact Chris. Um I don't know if Chris you have time, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, he, he may be able to help because I know that Chris you've dealt with a few issues like that so far. But similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've always found a way around it. Okay, same goes to every other um, questions. If you want to email Kutuba or Zhao directly, please ask your question. I don't think any more question uh, at this time. So Sarah may conclude the session. 
Thank you again for everyone that spoke today and for those that attended and asked questions. We're grateful for everyone's contribution today. And uh, just wanted to again thank everyone and um, remind you these are a continuing series to join in for another time. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking care of us. And thank, thank you. For everything. Thanks you a guys, lot. Well done. Great talk. See you guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.